So today we will focus on some published work that uh, I have done um, mainly in Trento, and also some uh, data, uh, new data I get in Cambridge. So I think that everybody knows the CRISPR-Cas9 or has uh, heard about it or is using it for uh, some experiments. And uh, I mean, just to briefly remind, so this is a RNA-guided nuclease that exploit comp complementarity between the RNA and the target DNA of interest. And uh, an important aspect you want to bear in mind is that uh, the recognition requires usually the presence of a so-called protospacialization motif that is a nucleotide sequence recognized directly by the protein on the target DNA. Usually it's a short, short sequence uh, and uh, the combination of uh, the recognition of the target and uh, of the uh, presence of a pound will allow you to target a particular region in the genome. So uh, the usual way people use uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is to cut the genome and exploit cellular repair machinery to either create uh, some damage in the sense of a small insertion or deletion uh, in a semi-random way or uh, uh, exploit the cleavage to introduce new DNA sequences using the homology director repair approach. The CRISPR universe is growing and the technologies are growing every day. And so now we have not only nucleases or any case, but we have also version of CRISPR that can allow you to change single bases in a very precise way. For instance, the, the aminase, and we have uh, CRISPR transposase. I think that they are still more, well, uh, better validating bacteria, but probably they will not take longer to have them working on mammalian cells, where you can have uh, target integration of pieces of DNA in whatever part of uh, the genome. And you have also prime editors that are a very clever way to introduce uh, small insertion and deletion um, on uh, a target region of interest. So altogether, all this technology can allow you to modify the genome in an unprecedented way compared even only to 10 years ago. And this is the CRISPR family and the CRISPR technology platform is not just to modify the genome, but there are a number of tools that will allow you to watch the genome, see how the chromosome move or the gene of interest move during the cell cycle, but also allow you to activate or deactivate genes without uh, changing the DNA sequence in that using CRISPR activator or repressor, for instance, by changing the epigenetic, or you can also use the CRISPR tools to modify uh, directly RNA. So leaving the genome the same, but just modifying the messenger. So there are again base editors or system for tracking or system to uh, degrade uh, a target RNA of interest. In all of these system, there is a problem that is specificity because uh, if a target region is partially complementary to, uh, <clears throat> to your ideal uh, uh, ELDR target, you may have uh, still activity in uh, what is essentially an off-target. So you may have um, editing or uh, cleavage in the wrong place. This is uh, mainly dependent on the sequence itself. So you can have very bad sequences that embed in the sense that they are very repetitive in the genome. So if you pick uh, a known target that have too many similar regions in the genome, you may end up cutting the genome or modifying the genome or activating the genome in several different positions. Vice versa, if you have uh, sequences that are unique, you can really have a very precise way to manipulate uh, uh, the cells. Uh, to tackle this main issue, people develop uh, several different technologies over time. So there were uh, the trick of using uh, Two, two guides and two Cas9 and a split nuclease to increase the size of the target region and increase specificity. The same using Cas9 nuclease, for instance, or FOC1 nuclease. Also, modifying the guide RNA can uh, leave you, can give you <coughs> increased specificity. And the same by increasing, um, using different ways to increase in the target recognition. Uh, a lot of people also work to improve in Cas9, to improve Cas9 itself for instance, by engineering the nuclease to be more specific. When we I was in Trent, I also work uh, a bit on this field and we develop a, a very high specificity nuclease to, to get uh, very, very precise genome editing for uh, clinical purposes. And it, there were, because this is a very hot topic, there were several generations of uh, high fidelity nucleases that were development 
were developed and um, it turned out that uh, yeah if you target some DNA RNA interfaces or some other region of the nucleus you you can work on the trade-off between specificity and activity and find some sweet spots for having a very active nucleus that is also high fidelity. Uh, nevertheless Delivery could be essentially a problem because if you if you use uh, even whatever high fidelity nucleus you want uh, and you leave it too long in the cell, there is always the chance that we'll target we we'll cleave in the wrong position. For instance, in this case, we we are using we are observing some experiment where we have an EGFP positive cells and we use a mismatched guide RNA to mimic of target, and you see that over time the percentage of, of target cleavage increase, both for wildfire Cas9 and essentially all the high fidelity Cas9 variants. So delivery is really something important to keep in mind and to focus on when you think about genome editing. Because you want to have the nucleus there or modify the genome for this, with the, the tools there for the short time possible. So at the time, uh, I started developing a method uh, that is essentially a kind of synthetic biology circuit where you have um, Cas9 controlling itself. So in this system, you can imagine to have a guide targeting the gene of interest and uh, modifying the genome. At the same time, an additional guide that can allow you to inactivate Cas9 itself. By tuning the features of the circuit, you can really control the length of Cas9 expression and uh, how genome things happen. So, in a very simple experiment in Isha, we just had four different plasmids, one for the target DNA, one as, um, um, to deliver Cas9, and one for each guide RNA. And it was not too difficult to find a sweet spot where you were able to use, I mean, essentially several different guide RNAs uh, that can all destroy Cas9. Here you see the decrease in the protein. And at the same time, keep, uh, despite the strong decrease in the Cas9 level, you can still have a very good on-target activity. This means that the amount of Cas9 that you usually deliver in the cell is essentially too high compared to what you need for genome editing. At the same time, it was interesting to see that uh, uh, in some circumstances, if you tune well the Cas9 level, you can also decrease of target activity. And so we went on with this project and we validated that the guided RNAs against Cas9 that were essentially orthogonal to the human genome had no uh, obvious of target uh, in the human genome. So here we use GAIS-seq, that is a method where you transpect an oligo and you use that as a, a to, lure, to lure out of target because you use it as a target for a PCR and go unbiased to see which uh, region of the genome the oligo in integrate and usually integrates in of targets or in double cell breaks essentially. So here we see that um, we had one guide RNA that was a bit of a problem giving a lot of a target, but two of them were very, very clean as expected. So we know target as expected when you are using an orthogonal DNA sequence compared to the genome. And we validated the system not only in plasma, but also in a stable cell line. And here was the same, in particular guide RNA A was very, very effective in diminishing uh, um, the, in increasing the on target of target ratio. And so playing with the circuit, um, you can also uh, tune a bit. So can you squeeze out more specificity, for instance, here, by just uh, further decrease the amount of Cas9? So a way to do it is, for instance, to optimize the guide RNA. So we took advantage of this optimized guide RNA that has essentially a shorter stretch of T here that should allow polymerase 3 that is usually used to express guide RNA to uh, produce more guide RNA and also a different uh, higher pin that should increase the binding to Cas9. And here you see that from eightfold of, sorry, a ratio on, uh, on target of target of eight, we went to a ratio on target of target of 12. So that was working. At the same time, by playing with the circuit, you can also revert it essentially. If you also optimize the guide against, against um, the, the gene of interest, you can cut it more, but also cut more of target. So it's essentially a circuit where you can really play a lot and tune the genomic as you want. And uh, so if we take, for instance, a guide RNA that was not working, if we optimize the expression of the anti-Cas9 guide RNA, it was not working, I mean, for improving specificity, now you just decrease a little bit more the amount of Cas9, and now you can see that you have a better discrimination on, of, on and off target. This was um, uh, observed also when we targeted the endogenous genes. 
the improvement was not incredible. I mean, it's a couple of folds, but it's reasonable for considering that um, this is essentially only tuning the Cas9 expression level. And uh, the um, improving specificity was also achievable in the moment you think about targeting, for instance, you know, two alleles. So here we use uh, GFP with a single mutation um, compared to the guide RNA, and we tried the HDR approach. So if we imagine to cut the genome and uh, repair part of it with an HDR approach, this kind of system can work also for uh, HDR. And uh, so the way of controlling an expression to improve the specificity of editing is a general concept because if we take uh, another different uh, CRISPR system, in this case coming from, instead of from, um, from Pyogenes, comes from Streptococcus thermophilus, we see that um, the result is the same. So taking three different guides against uh, Cas9, we see a decrease in Cas9 expression. And if we use, for instance, in this case, this uh, very simple reporter, we have a V5 out of frame respect to an EGFP. If, if you have a, a cleavage and uh, in the formation, the EGFP has a good chance to be on frame with the V5 and you can see the expression of the protein. In this very, very clean system to see um, uh, genome editing, you can see that in normal condition, you have again on and off target activity, but tuning, using, tuning the system using self-targeting guide RNA, you can still maintain off target and prevent off target activity and improve the specificity of uh, genome editing. That's, yeah, was a nice, uh, thing to play with the cells, but can we make it uh, a bit more meaningful? So can we put all the circuits pre-packaged and pre-programmed in a lentiviral vector that uh, can activate the program in the moment we deliver to the final cell? And this is a bit challenging because you need to consider that you need to prevent Cas9 and gather an expression both in bacteria to prepare DNA and also in packaging cells because you don't want to activate the circuit and destroy your vector in the moment you produce the lentivirus. And you want that the system is constitutively active and the program can run in the target cell. So what uh, we found that were, there were issues in all of these steps and um, we find solution for them. So mm, the first problem was that we had uh, leak expression, probably because of um, an ampicillin promoter up here that drives uh, um, somehow expression of Cas9, uh, even in bacteria. And I mean, if you think about it, you just need a very, very little amount of leak expression of Cas9 to destroy your plasmid. What was surprising was that there was also leak expression of the guide RNA. So the solution we came up with, uh, and actually, I, I want to thank Oscar because we were always using small introns in uh, some of our constructs uh, at the ICGB. And I took that intron and I localized it within Cas9. And the result was, of course, that bacteria cannot read introns. And so we prevent Cas9, Cas9 expression in bacteria now. And of course, the intron will be read in the, in the producing cells. And so now we can get our plasma and we can produce our viral vectors. And um, so when we look at the producing cell now, having solved the issue in bacteria, is that we need to keep the circuit off also here. And the way to do it was use uh, repressors. So we created a cell line containing the repressor and having the tetoperon on both self-targeting guide RNA and Cas9. As you can see here, when the system is um, active in the sense that without doxycycline that goes and repress the promoters, you have uh, unfortunately still a little bit of Cas9 expression. And this is somehow expected because uh, the promoter to express the viral genome will continue to express a very big RNA and the promoter will be able, and the ribosomes will be able to translate a little bit of Cas9. Uh, at the same time, the guide RNA is not expressed because we don't see any drop in the level of uh, Cas9 when there is a self-targeting guide RNA, where is here and uh, here. And while if we open the circuit, now both Cas9 level increase and also the guide RNA is expressed. And as a result, you have the circuit activate and, uh, and uh, Cas9 is, uh, gene is destroyed. So there will be a transit kind of expression and then uh, a drop uh, in its amount in the cell. So what anyway we can also see is that uh, when the circuit, uh, only when the circuit is active, uh, we have uh, uh, genome editing on, in the presence of a target, for instance. When 
if we have here a control guide array against EGFP, this is the steady state level of EGFP. When we open the when we use the virus without cell targeting, this is the drop in EGFP level as we saw before. When we have the cell targeting circuit, still the vector is working and uh, dropping in GSP level. And um, so the system is essentially validating in producing cell. And um, of course, uh, um, this drop in Cas9 expression is due to presence of editing and indels in, the, in uh, its gene. And when we go to a target cell, what would happen? So when we go to a target cell and we activate the circuit without repressor, of course. So in the target cells, the circuit is on, and you start expressing Cas9, you start expressing the guide RNA against Cas9 itself, and against the gene of interest. And the result is a very transient peak of Cas9 that we can barely see here, compared to a lengthy CRISPR control without cell targeting circuit. But nevertheless, uh, there is genome editing potential, and we I use the same plasmid here with the V5 and um, an EGFP to establish the potential of genome editing at the early time point. And those are long time points. As you can see, when you deliver CRISPR with the lentiviral vector, a long time points you continue to have a very high uh, genome editing potential, while with the self limiting circuit, there is no uh, genome editing uh, potential anymore. So we use this uh, circuit against um, the classical target genes that people use for um, CRISPR studies and genome editing, and we saw that the circuit was working, albeit there was, uh, and we squeeze, we work a lot to squeeze. Uh, specificity and to have uh, the minimal time of Cas9 expression. So on target efficiency dropped a bit, but uh, there was a clear advantage in the um, on target of target ratio. And this was true in hex cells, but also in um, human neuroprogenitor cells. And here, for instance, is a big picture of it in uh, primary fibroblast. And you see here there is the on target activity and here a number of different off targets. And the overall summary is that uh, no matter what genes you take, or if you look globally, uh, you are overall improving uh, the specificity of your genome editing, ex ex exploiting this circuit. The idea has been um, followed or in parallel developed by several other groups, and both for lentiviruses and for um, uh, AAV vectors. However, so the main disadvantage probably of this kind of system is that you, you're delivering DNA. And uh, so DNA always offer a potential concern in terms of safety because may integrate in composition. And um, so we went for a second generation of delivery tools that was based on DNA-free uh, systems. So in this case, uh, uh, we took advantage of um, um, the ability of uh, VSVG, that is the envelope of vesicular stomatitis virus, uh, is the glycoprotein of it, so the envelope protein, and to create, uh, um, to create um, uh, exosomes or exosome-like structure. So if you express this protein in a cell, the cells start to produce exosome coated uh, with uh, VSVG protein on the membrane. And this exosome can deliver proteins and uh, nucleic acids coming from the uh, producing cell. So uh, as you can see here, uh, if we look at the um, uh, um, cell extracts or the supernatant or even at the target cells, we can deliver Cas9 in vesicles, both the supernatant and the target cells, all in the presence of VSVG that will create this budding from the membrane and capture whatever is present in the cytoplasm. So we said, uh, okay, let's try if we can uh, deliver Cas9 with this way and the result was not so convincing at the beginning compared in particular for, to a plasma transfection because there were very little genome editing. So one of the issues is that uh, usually to express the guide RNA use a U6 promoter that is driven by pol 3 and uh, this does not allow polydenylation and there is no export to the cytoplasm of the guide RNA. So to test this, we uh, transfected the guide RNA to the cells uh, and then we deliver Cas9 using these uh, vesicles. And uh, the result was that there was an increase in genome editing. So it means that our particles were defective of guide RNA. So how do we solve it? And also again here, I want to thank Oscar because uh, I, it was basically a, a transplant of technology from what uh, we were using there for rotavirus in his lab. So for RNA viruses, because do, they replicate in the cytoplasm, you have to use trick to express the gene in the cytoplasm. 
And uh, because if you express them in a nucleus, there is a high probability of, of uh, um, losing the information because of splicing. And the way to do it is using T7 polymerase. And uh, so he had uh, some very useful um, cell lines and uh, system to express the T7 polymerase. And you can express imagine to first the seven polyethylene that is in the side of us, and then you have the guide in the right position to package with Cas9 and uh, be loaded in the uh, in the vesicle, in the body in vesicles. There is a problem, however, that C7 polymerase is, is not fantastic in your cell type. For instance, usual packaging cells are HEC. And in HEC, we didn't see any genome editing activity when the guide was expressed by C7 polymerase, as we saw when it was expressed with uh, the U6 promoter. However, if you go to a cell line like BHK21, that is uh, essentially uh, interferon deficient or less efficient in the interferon pathway, you can express very well the guide RNA from the T7 system. And this is because the polymerase will leave uh, five prime three phosphate that may activate interferon. This is not a huge, huge problem in the moment the guide RNA coupled with Cas9 because the three prime phosphate is partially masked by Cas9. And in this kind of cells, you can use either U6 or T7 to express the guide RNA you want. So we repeated the same experiment, and now we had a very good editing comparable with the plasma transfection, and also we had um, uh, no in enrichment of editing when we pre-transfected the target cell with the guide RNA. So this means that the majority of Cas9 in our particles producing BHK21 cells using the T7 array polymerase system to express the guide, um, are, um, so Cas9 is essentially coupled with the guide RNA. And um, so we, went, we did the estimation of how much of the Cas9 was packaged in these particles and probably it's about 1% or so. So there is definitely a way to, I mean, uh, improve the packaging of Cas9 in this kind of molecules, but at least the guide RNA uh, um, incorporation was very good. And um, this molecule, these vesicles were able to deliver Cas9 in a very transient way as expected because it would deliver essential protein, maybe a little bit of RNA as well, but mainly protein. And so after even 24 hours, you don't see the nucleus there anymore. While if you think about what happened when it delivered plasmid or a lentiviral vector, this is exactly the opposite. After one day, you just start to accumulate your product. And these have a major impact when you look at uh, genome editing, because you can see here again with the guide seek analysis that uh, the on target mark here with the square is more or less the same, but the off target profile is completely different. If you control well delivery of Cas9, you can really prevent off target activity, keeping a very, very high on target. And the editing efficiency was comparable with other ways of delivering Cas9 in the form of RMP, for instance, electroporation, but also um, uh, like other kind of liposomes. And the toxicity profile was kind of good. And this allowed us to repeat the treatment essentially every second day. So you can transduce your cell with uh, this vesicle and uh, wash them out the next day and redo it and redo it and redo it until you have the genome of inter uh, level of interest you want. And the molecules per se are flexible, so you can imagine to incorporate uh, multiple guide RNA and do genomic deletions, or you can incorporate, um, uh, again, uh, multiple guide RNA for do using Cas9 and increase further the specificity in the way of using it as a NIC case. Uh, the, this kind of molecule work in several different cell lines, including human IPS, uh, T cell lines, and we even tested in vivo yeah, the ICGV actually in, with the collaboration with uh, Serena and uh, Mauro, and in the site of injection in the art, we saw um, a reasonable amount of genome editing. And uh, a lot of other groups, again, I mean, CRISPR is a so competitive field. A lot of other groups develop similar technologies. But I think that the, what really characterized uh, the method I presented you was the packaging of the guide RNA, because essentially no one really um, solve the problem, at least uh, in this generation of uh, similar molecules. I know that um, in the startup we created to exploit this technology, um, they are also working on the, um, they work on the improving Cas9 packaging. So I really think that we get uh, um, a very nice program for a pro product to do uh, trace the genome editing, except the modification of the genome you want.
So the CRISPR is, yes, technology, nice tool, but it's also therapy, right? Why we do it? And for therapy, um, I, I focus on uh, splicing the disease because they are pretty common. And actually, I've always been attracted by splicing because it's a strong topic at the ICGB, right? I mean, all the time I was there, there were many, many people working on splicing and how it works, how we can control it, how we can cure genetic disease caused by splicing defects. And um, so among them, cystic fibrosis is one of the most important. And this is also a very, very common genetic disease. And, um, all, and it's very simple because all the mutations are essentially on the CFTR uh, protein that is a channel that transports chloride. And if this, this um, channel doesn't work well, you have uh, a disease that uh, usually can cause a lot of problems, mainly because of lung and gut uh, manifestations. So um, in, there are several different types of mutation that can lead to cystic fibrosis. And uh, what uh, we, uh, as I said, we look for was uh, class five that are the splicing one. So here there are two mutations that uh, certainly are quite common uh, overall, in particular because the disease is per se is very, very frequent. And so we focus on this 3849 uh, uh, deep intronic uh, mutation that activate an exon, uh, cryptic exon, and uh, this one, the 3272 mutation that uh, is uh, uh, very, very common uh, in uh, Belgium where our collaborators on this project uh, work and um, had some samples. So let's start with the last one. Um, the, this mutation is uh, 26 bases inside the intron in, um, in the CFTR intron 19, and uh, the single base change activate a cryptic uh, three prime uh, splice site. And the result is that you have um, a CFTR that goes out of frame where this uh, wrong splicing occur. And uh, so at the beginning, uh, because if you think about the number of cells you need to target for CFTR treatment, probably an HDR approach could be challenging. You want something that uh, has very, very efficient. And the most efficient way, at least at the time, to modify the genome was uh, a disruptive way, so using normals and joining. So we decided, okay, we will try to delete this mutation and um, use the combination, either single or multiple guide RNA to try to remove the mutation. And we got some that were showing some effect on splicing. Here we see the transcripts from a mini gene. And uh, unfortunately, Cas9 was not the right tool for this job because when we went even in a stable mini gene in HEC instead of uh, plasmid, uh, we saw no editing activity. And so the idea was, okay, let's go and let's try a different uh, Cas9 system. And yeah, I mean, if you think about the CRISPR Cas9 family, there are a number of different uh, uh, orthologs available, but I mean, I don't think that we should uh, look so close. And I mean, the CRISPR universe is so wide now. So we have uh, a huge number of tools and we can really select the, one, the right one for, uh, for our region of interest for our DNA modification. And we pick uh, type five. Type five is very interesting because it's uh, somewhat specular to Cas9. So all Cas9 orthologue would have been the PAM region in the same position. So if there is a problem to reaching that PAM, they will never work. But if you take Cas12, you will be able to target the same region and cleave essentially in the same position, but having the PAM in a different position. And that may enable you to, car to cleave a region where Cas9 is failing. And uh, also, there is a different uh, important aspect, right? So you see by the index here that uh, while Cas9 causes a blunt cleavage or semi blunt, just one nucleotide uh, stagger, Cas12. Uh, uh, create uh, um, stagger ends. And uh, this has, in, has a huge impact on the type of indels you obtain. So Cas9 usually gives you a lot of plus one, minus one because of its uh, blunt cleavage and with some bigger indels, usually driven by macromology. And Cas12 does the opposite. A lot of larger indels are very often driven by macromology. And uh, the result was that even a single guide RNA here, this plus 11, was effective in repairing the splicing uh, of our defective uh, um, CFTR uh, model. 
And so um, we went on characterizing the single guide RNA that is essentially targeting uh, the mutation and cleaving nearby it uh, for further studies. So we went to a stable integrated minigene, and here was still very active with 60% um, of editing and, uh, and um, a lot of splicing correction. And what was interesting, again, as I mentioned, when we look at the type of index we were getting, right? So the most frequent one was a deletion of 18 bases involving these six bases of homology. So because the cleavage is stagger, is triggering uh, a DNA repair involving micromology and removing essentially the mutations, <clears throat> the mutation or removing what is essentially the cryptic spy site. So as the result, the new sequence, when we test each index separately in the mini gene, most of them were improving splicing. And uh, the, reason, the reason why they were improving splicing is uh, shown here. So this, we used two different programs to predict the strength of the three prime splice site in the region where there was the mutation. So if you consider the wild type sequence here, you see that this is a very, with the wild type sequence, that this is not recognized as a splice site because uh, it's not uh, a strong splice site. With the mutation, you have uh, much more probability to have splicing. And what we saw was that the minus 18 and also the majority of the indel we create consistent with the uh, in vivo data, I mean, in, in cell data, they were diminishing the strength of the three-prime splice site. And this is why we see a recovering splicing. So we remove the elements that make the sequence a splice site, despite actually the mutation is still there. We just remove everything else. So we tested in more clinically relevant cells like um, RNA cells and intestinal organs. And again, we saw a very good uh, splicing correction. Here the mutated, um, uh, so usually, you have to bear in mind a splicing mutation usually always um, has always a second gene knockout of CFTR in the cell. So at the end, both alleles are knockout, and, and that is enough to correct one to uh, recover the phenotype. So here you see the normal splicing, and the, that is due to the um, five um, delta F5 away mutation and the aberrant splicing that is slightly lower, probably because of non-sense media decay involving the um, splicing mutation. And uh, so despite you don't see well the mutation here, if we take the entire sequence, the entire band, and we send for sequencing, we can use the chromatogram the convolution to analyze the splicing pattern. For instance, in the control condition, we see that there is uh, some correct splicing because of the uh, compound heterozygous mutation and um, the aberrant splicing. And after genome editing with Cas12, uh, we observe that the aberrant splice is completely gone. And what was very interesting was that in these um, um, clinically relevant cells, we got not only a correction of splicing, but also very high efficiency of editing in the target region. And because Cas12 is a natural high fidelity nuclease, we got also essentially no indels in the compound heterozygous allele that is actually wild type for that sequence. So overall, we are cutting the genome in a single position or at, and uh, um, correcting a phenotype. And uh, the indels were very, very consistent between different cells. So what we saw in the mini gene was also true uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the endogenous genes in cyber cells and in targets in organoids, where we see that this minus 18 is always the most uh, uh, present mutation there. So the primary sequence of DNA has a major role in determining what type of indels, and of course, the type of cleavage that your nucleus does has also a big impact of what repair you have. So as I mentioned, this cleavage was uh, in a unique position in the genome because when you use both guys seek, that is a genome-wide method to seek for off-target or targeted deep sequence of potential off-targets, we didn't see any relevant uh, off-target activity. And uh, our collaborators in Belgium had um, organoids, intestinal organoids, and we, you can transduce the organoids with um, um, lentiviruses in this case, because it was the best way to transduce organoids. I mean, I don't know what, is this clear and known what is the best way to deliver a nucleus for uh, CFTR in vitro, uh, in vivo, sorry, for treating patients, but certainly you want to have a very good method to, to treat uh, to, for your um, uh, in vitro studies, and lentiviruses in this case are the best for organoids. So we use lentiviruses, and uh, 
uh, you, with Orgres, you can directly measure the functionality of your repair, right? Because you can check the spontaneous or induced swelling of organs that, are, that is completely de dependent of CFTR activity. So what we did was these experiments and uh, we observed that uh, uh, with uh, guide RNA uh, editing uh, the, uh, the, the, that we have validated before, editing this target region, we managed to have a, a very a big enlargement of the organoids uh, uh, that was matching actually with no statistical difference, was matching the gold standard is essentially delivering the CFTR cDNA directly. So genome editing can match genome addition strategy without essentially the necessity to have a semi-random insertion of a vector in an ideal setting. And um, this is true not only for endogenous welding, but also when you further activate CFTR with phoscholine. And again, the genome editing was matching the efficiency of uh, CFTR addition strategies. And so is it, uh, is this technology, this approach limited to five frames per, three frames per site, or can we use it also for five frames per site? So we took the other very common mutation in splicing for CFTR, that is uh, um, 3849, uh, deep intronic mutation. And uh, in this case, you have um, the mutation activate a cryptic uh, three frames per site and create uh, and activate a cryptic exon. So again, here we select the sequence. In this case, we really pick one. And uh, we saw that there were some um, micromologies up and down the target region that will likely favor the deletion of the mutation. And uh, we got the same results essentially. So we got uh, here, you see the little amount of, uh, uh, of the aberrant splicing. And again, also in this case, the cells are compounded terazygous. So this wild type sequence is actually a non-functional CFTR because of a different mutation, more difficult to repair actually, compared to the splicing one. And here by genome editing, we make disappear this band. And so we correct the phenotype and the, same, the reason is the same. The editing we do is disrupting on the three, on the five frames per site. And we, we calculate for each editing event, the score, of, and the, the power of these, uh, the remaining sequence to act as a five frames per site, you see that they, they are even better than the, the natural sequence. So you basically prevent splicing because there's no five frames per site there. Also in this case, genome editing was uh, at least specific because again, Cas12 is a very high fidelity nucleus, even as a wild type compared to Cas9 and for to many other. And uh, this was confirmed by the fact that also in this case, the guide had no, had no off targets genome-wide measured by GASIC and also the closest sequence we calculate in silico to be off target, we didn't see any uh, relevant editing. Uh, also in this case, we validate functionally um, the, the um, recovery of, um, CFTR activity in organoids, and we saw again that uh, gene editing can match gene addition uh, to, uh, to recover uh, function, the function of organoids from patients. And, and this is, of course, correlate with editing. Here, the editing may seem not too high, but you have to bear in mind that the maximum editing you can get is 50%, because this um, estimation was based on botulin. And despite this, you, can, you are really, really also, you're really matching the genome strategy. So it's very, very promising. And uh, we also tried, I mean, to be honest, right? Because I'm probably selling a lot of Cas12 in this moment, but we did our best to get the same result with Cas9. But because of the type of indels you create with Cas9, we were never able to use a single guide RNA. And of course, that uh, decreased efficiency in the moment you have to use two because getting a deletion is less efficient, uh, using two guides is less efficient to have a cleavage using a single one uh, because you need coordinated activity. And so, yeah, we got some functional recovery, but uh, we, never be able, we have never been able to match the um, uh, recovery of organoid uh, uh, swelling and CFTR activity we observe with the single guide RNA and Cas12. So these are probably the to most validated CRISPR system in the literature so far. And uh, 
you should really pick between Cas9 and Cas12, the one that suits better your purpose. For instance, as I mentioned, when you have, uh, if you want to, they have this different in their profile. And as you can see also here from this published data by other groups, you have much more micromology repair for Cas12 compared to Cas9. And people use uh, micromologies to drive target integration in the genome, right? Let's say, you, know, you want to target endogenous protein. Yeah, you can cleave the genome in the position, cleave your plasmid and have a target integration there exploiting micromologies. And I mean, they publish very well this work and yeah, it's a good idea. But the problem is that if you really look at the data, Cas9 is probably not the right enzyme to do this, to do this kind of experiments and this kind of genome tagging because I mean, among the, the data they show here, 50% of the sequence contain indels. So you are screening clones that are not exactly what you want. And in this case, in this different uh, junction, all of them contain some sort of mutation. So in the amount you, your genome editing specificity and I mean, precise junction, precise integration matters. This is not the nucleus to use. What we thought was Cas9 can do a better job. So. Uh, this was a side project here at LMB. So I, starting with the guide RNA we used, I tried to figure out what's the mechanism. So when you have a gene break that is not blunt, uh, what uh, in this case for, uh, for, um, Cas9, for Cas12, you create a five prime um, overhang. So what the cell machinery does is at the end to, to trim it, to modify it and create a three prime overhang. So by doing so, you, you are essentially exposing a part of this single strand. And if you put the micromologies there, you can use this drive, micromology to drive your integration. And for Cas9, this is not fantastic because you have already the blunt cleavage that may favor uh, classical non-homologues and joining instead of this alternative one. And also you can have some of the bases that are not exactly homologous to the target, depending on how you orient your guys. So we test the system with Cas12 and was really surprising that even only leaving what is, we calculate to be three nucleotides, we were able to drive a precise integration, at least to some extent. But when we went to a length of micromology that was even kind of small, like 13, we basically saw only precise junction between the donor DNA and the target region. So we went on with, this was one target, and then we went on for a direct comparison with Cas9. So I pick a different region where I got uh, two very, very close Cas12 cleavage point. And you see this, this is again, the length of the micromology and this is essentially the amount of indels you have uh, in the junction. So the more indels, the less precise is your target integration. And uh, so both the guides behave very, very well also here. And compare, in comparison, cleaving in the same position with Cas9, we got much more noise in the junction as published in the, uh, in, as uh, consistent with the paper I, uh, from other groups I showed you before. While in the moment you go with Cas12, for instance, in, another, in the other junction, the three prime, you have in this case a slightly more uh, index, but again, compared to Cas9, there is no competition. So, the take a message is in the case you want to modify your genome of, gene of interest and on tag your protein of interest and work with uh, a tag endogenous protein and use micromology because is sometimes cloning homology arm is a bit uh, challenging and sometimes not always possible. So microbiology is a very useful strategy to modify the genome, but definitely pick Cas12 instead of Cas9. And so we can find it also by deep sequencing and with different, even longer homology length. Of course, if you go with longer homology length, also Cas9 start to be better. But uh, I mean, I think that this is a very good idea to use directly Cas12 because of uh, its properties and the natural tendency for doing so. And uh, again, if you inhibit non-homologous and joining, you can further favor the precise integration. So if your cell can tolerate inhibition of uh, DNA PK, you can use this drug and uh, in combination with Cas12 and having virtually only precise integration in the, genome, in the region of interest you want. So why I'm talking about doing precise integration, modifying the genome, 
and potentially doing in a scale way where you want to target many, many different positions at the same time, right? Because um, um, so now I'm shifting a bit on synthetic genomics. And in this case, you would like to, let's say, be able to walk in the genome and build the genome and modify the genome in a repetitive way. So for instance, CAS-12 can allow you to uh, create a simple system for micromology delivery where you just have the same gather and target in the genome that also liberate your fragment for precise integration. So it's very, very, very simple and you can have very, very clean targeting. So in synthetic genomics has a very ambitious goal, right? That is building genomes, but it's very, very challenging. If you think about what now we are very, very good in reading genes, uh, reading genomes. I mean, the last, uh, probably a couple of weeks ago, there was the publication of the probably first telomere to telomere sequencing of the entire human genome. But I mean, synthesis, synthesis, synthesis wise, so how much are we good in writing genome? We are very far beyond. And the best example is actually in the lab I am now. So Jason and his team, uh, one year ago or so, published uh, uh, this nature paper where they managed to synthesize, starting from uh, essentially oligonucleotide synthetic blocks, the entire genome of E. coli. And, they, and they, in doing so, they removed three codons. So they have this life form that lives in the absence of three codons from its entire coding sequences. To prove so, that they remove uh, all, the codons, all the codons for a couple of serines and uh, all these codons from serines and um, uh, from one of the three stock codons, they also remove the tRNAs. And again, in this case, they have a living cell with a compressed genetic code. So why to do so? Well, first, you are challenging the boundaries on biology. So what's the really minimal set of things you need to live, right? And uh, second, you can create orthogonal living system because this cell here with a compressed genetic code is phage resistant. So if you infect with the virus, the virus cannot be translated. I mean, it is a way to create biology with uh, talking a different language, essentially, where each codon is very, can be reassigned potentially to a different amino acid. And at the same time, you, it opens new technology because you can use non-canonical, um, um, so you can use orthogonal tRNAs coming from um, bacteria usually, and that are able to incorporate non-canonical amino acid. And by doing so, you can imagine to create new polymer, you can expand the genetic code again, you can create polymers, uh, that uh, do not exist in nature, genetically encoded. And also you can imagine to create, uh, because I just published in a science paper where they create polyesters genetically encoded in bacteria. So can really drive a technological revolution. But uh, so what I'm focusing on now, and uh, we are actually hiring people, we are looking for a 12, 12 postdoc, is to create uh, a human genome. So, I mean, and there is a big void between being able to synthesize the E. coli genome and the entire human chromosome. And uh, I really hope I will be able in the future to give a, a new talk and uh, describe you how to build a human chromosome, how to build a human genome. And this is well supported now by Wildcam, uh, DLMB and Sanger. And um, to conclude, I want, uh, yeah, Starting from the end, I would really like to thank uh, Jason for uh, having me here at LMB uh, as an investigator scientist and leading this uh, project. And uh, Simona, who did the um, um, CAS-12, uh, CAS-9 micromology comparison for her uh, master thesis. Then I want, of course, to, to acknowledge Oscar because he's been the greatest um, uh, mentor ever, I think. And um, also the, all the people from the SCGB for the collaboration. Uh, Serena, Mauro, and also Anna for the freedom I had uh, in Trento in developing my ideas and this project, and Julia for her work on CFTR, Antonio for his work on um, uh, slices and uh, the vesicles, and Claudia as well for the vesicles, and uh, all the other collaborators in the De Michelis lab, uh, Francesca, Davide, Alessandro, and uh, the Conti lab, Con Luciano Conti, and our collaborator in Belgium. And thank you for the attention.